Okay, so um, all that we were setting up was the ability to see that, yeah, you fill something in gibberish and you click join and it'll say, okay, we clicked it. That's all we've done so far to make sure that in the event of clicking join, it's recognizing it. All of the code is doing that so far. In the event of clicking submit, we're going to start to do something. So if that part works, now we can start to get a little more complex. So this is the part where we need to check the um, we need to check what has the person typed. We need to check what they've typed into those fields, and then we need to do a lot of things. Does that user already exist? If they do, well then tell them and let them log in. If the user doesn't exist, well then actually save that data and then create an account and so forth. The cool thing is that we're going to be able to do a system of accounts and such uh, without any extra special servers or anything like that. Oftentimes, you need a server or cloud infrastructure to save user accounts and all of that. We're going to use a version where we will save the data of the person specifically in uh, the device or the browser. So eventually, uh, this information is going to be saved in the browser and then eventually we'll talk about saving it in the cloud but we have a way to save data in the web browser kind of like a cookie when you visit a website and it saves stuff on your computer we can do something like that to save information well we need to see what the person typed into these boxes first so um, in the function sign up we have confirmation that it should not be automatically refreshing. That's what prevent default does. And on console log, um, we have confirmation that, yeah, clicking it does give some sort of feedback. Next lines, two lines in here. Um, we're going to create some variables. We're going to create some objects of those input fields where the person's typing into. VAR dollar. We're going to use jQuery here. L in email sign up equal to dollar something comma next line dollar L in password sign up equal to dollar something comma next line dollar L in password Confirm, sign up, equal to dollar something, semicolon, end of statement. So I, I'm creating three variables at once. I say var one time because remember this, comma, another variable, comma, another variable, the end, end of statement, semicolon. Do not put vars at the beginning here because we've got commas here, not semicolons, that's an error. We're using jQuery, so not document.getElementById. We use the jQuery selector. We use this command here, which is basically go find something, document.getElementById. Well, the something in quotes, needing the pound sign here. You need the pound sign here because we didn't explicitly say document.getElementById. This is sort of like saying document get element by query or something, specifically a quote or a, per, uh, a pound sign in email sign up. The spelling is different because in the HTML it says ID equals in email sign up. And it's common to have the second word capitalized, not the first. Well, here, the first word is L. The second word is in. And for beginners, yes, this is weird, annoying, confusing. OK, leave it as lowercase. But then now that doesn't look quite right. The purpose of the uppercases is to delineate each word. Now, this might not exactly look like separate words. But because it's the second word in the object's name, capital letter. The second one here then is also quotes pound in lowercase password sign up. And the third one quotes pound in password confirm 
sign up. The way to make sure that you typed all of this correctly is you could do the split view and confirm that that email sign up is in the HTML spelled the same. So in my sign up screen in HTML, there is the input with an ID in email signup. <clears throat> and that's what I'm trying to select over here. Um, yes. Question. On the left side there you have dollar in email. Mm -hmm. Is it fixed name or whatever you create? Or is it fixed name for jQuery? The L part is not fixed. We can prefix it however we want. And I'm using EL to mean element. We're selecting an element. So it can be anything we want. Uh, I abbreviate it like password. That's fine. Another type. Yeah, and then you can name these anything you want as long as you remember what you called them. So uh, over here then, uh, that lines up there, in password sign up, uh, yeah, I spelled that one right, and then in password confirm sign up, I spelled that one right. So um, you can view them side by side, and that's one way to confirm you know that what I'm searching for there is that, and I'm making a brand new jQuery element or object based on jQuery selector. We're going to select something with an ID that there it is. There's something in the HTML with an ID of that. This is when abbreviations and such might be helpful. You just have to remember to be consistent with your abbreviations. Did I call it PSW or did I call it PASS or did I call it PWD? You just have to be consistent with your own terminology. Yes? Is there a reason why we, you changed it from being L capitalized N? Like I said a moment ago, the reason is uh, just, just differentiate, the differentiate the different words because this is the second word, capital here. But it was not the second word here, so lowercase. That's the second word. Right. First word, second word, so caps. Is it ideal because it's a variable for jQuery? Is it, is it what? Is it ideal because it's an element for jQuery that you want to differentiate that? No, the differentiation, uh, you mean even adding EL at the beginning? No, not that. Just the capital. capital. It's only ideal in terms of readability. So on many languages, they have these mixed capital letters just to read it. And it could all be lowercase, and it'll work fine. And then the EL, too. And EL, I'm just using it as a prefix for element. It doesn't have to be jQuery thing. It's just I'm using it as, as an element. Uh, I see people often also just call it E for element. Um, EL elements, or any prefix to delineate to me what the object is. So here we've created um, here we've created um, JavaScript variables based on HTML nodes or elements. Um, what I want to see if this is working so far. Next line, console dot log dollar l in email sign up dot val open and close parentheses so we've done this already uh, create objects based on HTML nodes okay we won't need to repeat ourselves many times but okay we created objects based on HTML nodes then what we're doing here is console output to show what the value of those fields are. Using the jQuery, jQ, the jQuery method 
val. So there's a jQuery command, a method, called val. Its purpose is to read or write a value into something or from something. So I'm saying here, into the console, let's display what's inside of this variable, specifically its value, what they typed. Save it and, and run it. Fill something into those fields. And click the Join button and see if you get some feedback in your console, F12, that shows what you wrote in your email sign-up. The value of what you wrote into that input field. Let me check mine. Let's see if mine's working. So I wrote something into the email, something into the password. I click join. I get, I get that something. I should get that something. It says on line 37, you executed a command, and I get that output. So it should, it should do that. There's a variable. Let's see what's in the variable, specifically the value. Because we can see what's the value, what's the, what's the uh, color of it, what's the size of it, uh, what's the x and y position of it. We can have all of these properties of that object. I want specifically the value that was typed into those into that field. And then of course, if I wanted to see what did I type into the password and confirm password, I need the same thing. Console log. Dollar L in time for copy and paste. Dot val. Don't forget those parentheses. There's the pre there's double parentheses right here because this ending parenthesis goes with the log log method parentheses and the double parentheses in val because we've got the val method. Nothing in the parentheses. And then in uh, console, one more, uh, L in password confirm. So I've got, an, I've got a variable, and in theory, I wrote something into it. I captured what, what the person wrote in the event of first filling in those fields and then clicking submit. This whole thing runs. It then <coughs> captures those elements and then here okay display the value of those elements so I'm gonna type something here and something here they're in the password field so they're hidden but when I click join it runs the code and it says okay on the first box you type that and in the second box you type that so those password fields are not doing anything complex of like actually encrypting your password or anything like that. There's no you know, uh, RSA 256-bit encryption or anything. There's no encryption or anything happening really. It's just those um, that text is being replaced by dots. So we are able to see what the text was written in there. We are able to store it and then we can encrypt it and all of that. Um, but we're able to see here that it says, okay, on line 37 you did that, and line 38 you did that, and line 39 you did that. And it was console output. As we do this console output, it, um, it can get very easy to lose track of um, what am I actually outputting as I do all of this feedback to myself without any um, without any context. Like right now, we're still basic, so we know, okay, there's the email, there's the, con there's the password, there's the confirm password. But as we do this over and over and troubleshoot it and test it and debug it, we're going to lose track of what are we outputting. So it's actually better to, um, in addition to what the variable is, it's also good to put a little message here. So quotes plus email. So it'll say in the log, 
email is that? Quotes plus password is that. Confirm password is that. Remember putting stuff in quotes. Putting in quotes will appear exactly as that. It's a, it's a literal. It's a string. Literally, you will see that. So my console will literally first say email, plus then it'll display the value of that object. Next line, it'll say password, plus. So it will also then display the value of that object. And I would recommend to do this much more than simply output what's in my variable. You're going to lose track of it so fast. You know, all of these codes are going to be bumping around in your head. What am I doing? So even with stuff like uh, simple console messages like that, um, giving yourself even more like little hints and comments and stuff really helps. So that's just a little bit of a flourish uh, when I fill this stuff in here. And I join. The email was that, the password was that, the confirmed password was that. Does not match. It hasn't been programmed to care if it matches or not yet. You see here we're slowly building up to this point where we are getting uh, step by step to the point where uh, we are checking what did the person type and then uh, we're seeing they typed something. Uh, we then need to start to um, do some of this um, uh, validation. The important thing of course is do the passwords match. Uh, we can get very complex. Um, of course about checking is the password eight characters long does it include exclamation points all of that complex stuff we, we're not gonna get that complex at the moment we simply want to check that the passwords match just like a real app or a real website so if we see here that we are able to see the values of uh, what the passwords are we can compare them does the password and the confirmed password match? Are they exactly the same? If they are, great, let's create an account. If not, tell the person, whoops, your password doesn't match. Next line. Conditional statement. To check if passwords match. or not. Conditional statement. There's got to be a condition. On the condition that the passwords match, create the account. On the conditions that the passwords don't match, tell them your passwords don't match. Try again. So here's the part where we have to set up an algorithm, a way of doing things for um, our app to make a little decision. Not exactly to, to think, but to make a very simple decision. Do the passwords match, yes or no? And ultimately, uh, computer logic is a, it boils down to yes or no. Is this true or is this false? So we're going to check this again. Do the passwords match, true or false? Passwords match, true? OK, let's create the account. Passwords, ma passwords match, false? Try again. So we have a way to check a condition.
which is known as an if-else statement. If something happens, do. If something is true, do something. If something is false, do something else. We can get very complex and ask multiple questions. Of course, we'll do that later. Here's just a very simple yes or no. Do the passwords match? Do they not match? This is going to check here. If something is true, in the parentheses, do something. Or else it's false. This is a very simple true or false. If something is true, execute. If something is true, execute or run the line and run the code in this block. Or else it's false. Or else it's false. So execute code in this block. You see these curly braces here. If parentheses curly braces. If that happens to be true, do everything in those curly braces. And that can be two or two hundred lines of code. Or else it was false. Okay, then skip that part and jump to else and do the stuff here. And that could be two or two thousand lines of code. So we need to ask it something. We need to check something. We need to see what the condition is. I'm basically trying to check do the um, do the passwords match or not. And the thing when it comes to you know human logic and computer logic, it, it, it almost seems like we're speaking two languages. Because let's say, you know, in the in the real world I'm gonna say, okay, if, if I'm hungry, I'm gonna go eat. Well, that wouldn't exactly be what how you would ask it in computer ease. You would say if hunger equals true, go eat. Or else, hunger equals false, don't eat. And then we can even do it backwards. Yes, I'm not hungry, so don't eat. I'm confusing myself already. So we can have it directly ask it yes or no, or like the opposite of yes or no. But it's just going to be yes or no, true or false. Binary. Two options. So what we need to do here then is say dollar l pass l in password sign up dot val. We're going to check the value of the password they put into the sign up field. We're going to check it against the value of the confirm variable. I'm going to say exclamation point equals equals. I'll get back to that in a moment. Dollar L in password confirm sign up dot val. This is basically saying not equal to. If the value of the first password is not equal to the value of the confirmed password, do something versus do something else. Console log. Passwords don't match. So this if is always checking for it to be true. Then the other result must be false. So if and all of these conditional statements in every programming language always basically check for truthiness. It is a word. But it's checking for truth. When we do if, unless we do opposite and not and all of that. So here the exclamation point is saying not, double equals. We've seen that with a simple equals, basically it's assignment we're assigning. If we had that, it would be 
it would be so confused because they would say, take the value of the thing on the right and put it into the value of the thing on the left. With the exclamation point, we're saying, um, well, if it was then double equals, then we're saying, actually check, D do these things actually match? Single equals is put the thing on the right into the thing on the left, assign it. Double equals, that's actually checking, does one equal one? And then exclamation point is not. If uh, the value here does not equal to the value there, we will get a message in our console that says the passwords don't match. It's true, the passwords don't match. If the value of the first password um, fails this test, false, OK, it's false. They do match. So in this else, we'll say console. Passwords do match. There's many ways. This is when you get into uh, discussions or arguments into what's the right way to do it. All of the ways are the right way if you get the result. If it's elegant, if it's efficient, if it, if it works. So there's many ways that we could be checking this, true or false. If you have another way, it'll probably work. Try it, and then tell me later. But this way. Um, this, this is a way to check that. Do these passwords match or not? So let's, let's check that out. Save it and run it. Type two passwords that are the same. You should get an output that says in your console that says passwords do match. If you type passwords that are different, you should get a message that says passwords don't match. Let me check my own before I send you off to check yours. So I'm going to type A, A, A. I'm going to type A. Join. It shows here my first password is triple A. My second password is single A. Passwords don't match. If I then put the triple A on both, uh, now it may be useful sometimes to clean your console here. If you see a little trash can or a little X out symbol, this kind of fills up a lot. So I find it useful to kind of clean clean your output there just so that you see fresh output. I'm about to click join again. I put AAA on both. Click join. AAA, AAA, match. Again, looking at our code. Check the value of the first password. If it does not match, the value of the second password, give the message they don't match. Or else, give the message they do match. Yeah? Well, what's the difference between the bang echo and versus bang echo echo? Okay. Can um, Simply like that. We are also, uh, with double equals, we're checking for um, type, uh, checking types as well. Is it a number versus a letter? So sometimes by not also checking type, it could cause weird results. Because the number one versus the letter one are two different things, and that would cause an error if we're not also checking types. Type of data. So. Great. So um, let's um, let's let's build a little bit more here because um, this conditional statement is checking if. Uh, if these passwords match, right? So based on this, we can further uh, we can further do our whole user system sign up. Um, oh actually one thing here, this is interesting. Uh, if we 
if we, uh, as we beta test this, actually we're, we're alpha testing this, we're testing this before anyone sees it, I put AAA and I put AAA join don't match. Why? A A A. Oh, lowercase, uppercase. Lower case, upper case. That does matter, and that is something we can take care of. We can actually force them to uppercase or to lowercase and such. We'll do that a little later, um, because uppercase and lowercase does matter a lot in JavaScript. This is a common problem of things. Was it uppercase or lowercase? So before we actually store it, we will convert the case just uh, for the ease of things. Um, this, this login system, of course, can be very complex. Uh, something like this. Even something like, uh, eventually when they're going to sign in, it'll, make more, it'll be more important when they sign in. They created the account lowercase. Next time they're trying to sign in, they type their password perfectly, but they put a capital A, it's going to say, I don't know that user. So in that case, it does matter for us to make it lowercase or uppercase to store emails. Make it all uppercase. Who cares if they typed it uppercase or lowercase or mixed it up? Just force it all to uppercase or lowercase to uh, avoid some problems. Right now we're giving ourselves um, we're giving ourselves a console output. We are giving ourselves the developer some feedback. Something's wrong. We want to give the user some feedback. Something's wrong. Uh, we've seen. Don't type this, but we've seen alert is a way to to give a message, but. We've also got a way uh, via uh, jQuery, jQuery Mobile, I mean, the jQuery Mobile interface design. We have a way of using jQuery Mobile to create pop-ups with animations and shadows and all of that. So we're going to make um, a pop-up appear that tells the person your password doesn't match. Now this uh, needs setup in HTML and then JavaScript. We need the setup in HTML because HTML is concerned with the content. So we're going to make a message in the HTML that says password doesn't match. Then in JavaScript, we're going to make that message appear. So we're going to back up to the HTML file. And we're going to back up to where our sign up screen is at. Let's go back to the HTML file, section sign up. If you, if you read over at the jQuery mobile documentation, there's a whole page that explains how to make pop-ups. Um, so basically, in whatever section we want the pop-up to appear, we, we write the code to make a pop-up. Uh, from, from this form, I have, the, I have the possibilities of mismatched password. So in this form, um, or after the form, but in the article, before the end of the article, we're going to make a little section here of possible error messages to give the user. So all error messages regarding the sign-up form will exist here. Making a note, we're back on HTML, so remember your HTML comment. jQuery mobile based error pop-up messages. Making the note, they uh, they should exist. They should exist in the article of this section in question.
So any error messages related to some sort of actions on a particular screen, those error messages, if we're using jQuery Mobile, those error, mes error messages and such, those pop-ups should exist in the article of the section that we're, that we're working with. So in HTML, we're going to create a div. The div is a plain old generic container. Inside of this div, there will be any message that we want, text or pictures or whatever, animation. Uh, but we'll say here, passwords don't match. The message passwords don't match will appear if those passwords don't match. Instead of console output, we want a message to appear for the person. This div right now is a generic div. It doesn't know to behave like a pop-up. It behaves like a pop-up because of jQuery mobile. So that goes back to data role. Pop-up. We have data role page, data role button, some other ones. Here's data roll. Data roll pop-up. Data roll button. Data roll page. Here's data roll pop-up. This div is going to behave like a pop-up. For basic styling, we will add a class, UI content. This pop-up pop is going to look very super, super basic without this. But with this, it has a simple coloring and drop shadows and stuff like the rest of uh, jQuery Mobile. And then we need to know, display this error message in the event of a mismatched password. Well, here's an object, here's an element in HTML, which we need to display via JavaScript. So what's the way that we reference an element in HTML and JavaScript? ID. ID. So we'll add an ID. And remember, I said I like to have the ID as the very last item, the very last attribute of an HTML element. And here, we will call this pop, just to prefix it. All our pop-ups will have pop. And then error, we'll have a bunch of errors. This one is specifically sign up, screen, mismatch. Later on, we'll have a couple of other errors. Uh, for example, the user already exists. You're trying to create a brand new account. You already exist in our database. So later, we'll have another pop-up. Pop, error, sign up, user exists. You know, really long, verbose IDs, but I think it's very useful as a beginner to be wordy, because then it makes more sense, I think. Um, I think while we're here, actually, we will create that second error message. So next line, we need another div. This time, the message itself will say, uh, account already exists. Well, that div needs to get upgraded with a data role, same one. Same class for basic styling, but a new ID. I'm using my syntax here. Data role pop up class UI content ID. Pop error sign up. So all of the errors related to my sign up screen, which are pop-ups, but then specifically this one, uh, we'll call it exists. The account already exists. So in the event that the account already exists, there's an ID here that we can call, that we can latch onto to make that pop out in JavaScript.
So the role of HTML again was the content. The role of JavaScript is in interactivity. I'm going to save my HTML file. We'll go back to the JavaScript. We have something to display in the event of a mismatched password. So then we'll write the JavaScript to make that appear, that content. This is all still going to happen inside of the um, inside of the if statement. I'm on line 45 or so in JavaScript. So this is where we last wrote console log password don't match. Uh, that uh, was console output for me, the developer. I want to display what uh, those pop-ups were, what's in those pop-ups to to the user. So. The um, the um, those pop-ups need to be defined as objects so that <clears throat> JavaScript can uh, can work with them. So just like zooming out here, just like when we created all of the when we created this you know, form sign up object, we need to create objects uh, for these pop-ups so that then we can use them in JavaScript, basically. Uh, so let's back up to line 14 or so, where we first created our, our element for the actual form. We're going to create uh, variables for these new pop-ups. based on the exact same syntax. Now, here's the thing. Some people love this, some people hate this. When I, if I would do it on my own code, I would go back, so don't do anything yet, but what I would do is I would remove the semicolon, and then do a comma, and then do my next code. Comma, next one, semicolon. Some people hate that because then, you know, you forget that that's a comma instead of a semicolon. So, if you leave that as, as a semicolon, then what you could do is create another variable, do your thing, semicolon, variable, another thing. So you just have to be aware of which of the versions you're, you're doing. Are you ending the line, semicolon? So then you have a new command, create the variable. You see it a lot, and it's more efficient to not have to say var every single time. It's three bytes, but that adds up, and it adds up, and it adds up, and it adds up. So it's more technically efficient to do comma, you don't have to say var again because we've already got var on the previous line. We're creating a new element. L pop error sign up mismatch equal to dollar something comma. I'm going to make another variable, so I'm not ending my statement yet. Next line dollar L pop error. Sign up exists. And here's where I forget that I put it singular or plural. Exists plural equal to dollar selector. So that's equal dollar selector. Then semicolon end of statement. So some people hate this because uh, oh I wrote var 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 here, but then I left a semicolon there, and then that doesn't work, and all of that. But this is more efficient to kind of borrow the keyword var three times. If you have to remember to put a semicolon instead of a, you have to remember to put a comma instead of a semicolon to continue that chain. It should be obvious then in the quotes here. Well, we're trying to select some object with some ID. Pop error sign up. Pound pop error sign up mismatch, pound, pop error sign up exists. Not with the L, because L is inside of the world of JavaScript, in our JavaScript file. And we need the pound sign because it's an ID. And it's lowercase because it's the uh, first word uh, in the name of the ID back on HTML. Error sign up, mismatch. Quotes, pound, pop, error, sign up, exists.
So we often have to do this, uh, again, creating a JavaScript object of an HTML element. Okay, we've got now sort of a, a reference or a pointer or, or a shortcut or a keyword to the uh, HTML object back on the HTML file. We've got now, we can start to use this, uh, the name of what it is here in the world of JavaScript. We can start using this now to start to do stuff in JavaScript. And I would recommend uh, copy that. We're about to use the name of the shortcut. It's not very short. We're about to use the name of that object back in that if-else statement. Now that we have a reference to the HTML element in JavaScript, we can use it back on the if statement. So if you're going to copy it, don't forget to copy the dollar symbol. That is the full name of the JavaScript variable. Okay, so we'll do paste after the console, the name of the pop-up, dot pop-up method make a jQuery pop-up uh, make a jQuery mobile pop-up appear on screen first initialize it then pop then show it on screen with options so this first line here is preparing to display it as a pop-up. Copy the same line and paste it. Then we have options. Where on screen, what size, what coordinates, what animation. So we kind of have to write it twice. The first time to initialize it so that it's going to behave like a um, like a pop-up. Then the second time, in the parentheses, quotes, let's actually open it. Let's actually display what is in that div. There's going to be a default animation of fade. So then we can say comma. curly braces. We had data transition flip to make something flip. Data transition uh, f uh, slide up to make it slide up. We, we can't do data dash transition here because that is HTML and we're in the world or the file of JavaScript. So the syntax is a little different. But inside of these curly braces, in quotes, we say transition, not data transition. Outside of those quotes, colon, more double quotes, and then the animation. The syntax is different, and it has to be, because we're writing this in, in JavaScript, not HTML. If it was back on HTML, it's simply data transition equals flip. But since we're doing all of this via jQuery or JavaScript, you have to do it this way. So curly braces, transition property, colon, flip value. We're about to open a pop-up that will flip into view after we've initialized it to behave like a pop-up. The pop-up should pop up when there is a mismatch, because we're checking, do these passwords not match? It's true, they don't match. So we saw the console output. We should then see the pop-up happen. Go ahead and save it and run it. Mismatch your password. And see if you get a little animation happening on screen of the message. Question? Um, on the HTML ID, I wrote that you put it in the top pair sign of screen. Um, what is I'm checking mine as well. Pop error sign up mismatch. No problem. Let me check mine. 
as long as it's all consistently typed the same thing, it'll work. So. Let's see here. Fill in whatever email a a a b b b join pop up passwords don't match. That's my console output. That's my jQuery mobile animation. I click outside of it. It unflips. I click join. It flips. So we had transition flip. We had transition pop slide up I'm just saying other kinds of animations here so if it worked we can play with these transitions and such we can play with the placement right now it's popping up right in the middle of the screen we can place it exactly to appear in the top right corner or anywhere we want with more options but let's say it's fine for the moment and, and the point should be that then when we mismatch our passwords so a a and b b join that was a slide up, a slight little slide up animation. You click outside of it to dismiss it, it slides back, backwards. I'll leave it with flip, or whatever you want. I haven't tried flow actually, I'm curious about that one. I wouldn't expect that one to look good. That's okay. Kind of a slide over in a way. I'll keep it as flip. Okay, so we're due for a break. If it worked, uh, great. If not, I'm going to put a version of my code up to this point, calling it temp2. If you need a quick look at my code, or call me over. And then we'll uh, take a break until 8.30, and then we'll go on.